Hello and welcome to the video. This video is part of a new series that I'm creating at the moment called Common RC Questions Answered. And I'll put a link here into the playlist because there's lots of other videos that I'm going to be creating like this, putting them all together. So if you're new to radio control or it's a hobby that you're interested in getting involved in and you're trying to demystify some of the very complicated technology and terminology that gets used all the time in the other videos knocking around in places like YouTube, then this is the place to be. If you're interested in finding out a little bit more about radio control, then I also have a series of other playlists on the channel that's probably worthwhile having a look at too. There's the Introduction to Remote Control series that's also on the channel that has lots of videos, some of which I'll be referring to in the video that you're about to watch. And there's also lots of other channels designed for newer pilots, and they're typically called Introduction to or For Beginners. So for example, there are Quadcopter Building for Beginners series and Wing Building for Beginners series too. But let's get down to the topic for this video. So this time we're going to talk about LiPo batteries. Now all of these things in front of us are examples of LiPo batteries, little two cell, three cell, four cell LiPo batteries, varying sizes, varying capacities. And in this video, I'll hope to try and dispel some of the myths about what they are and how they work. So first of all, let's talk about what we need to know. So if I pull this battery out here, we can see that it has four cells in it. So each of these individual little silver packages are cells and you can see it clearly inside this battery but it's exactly the same inside here. So underneath this cover are the cells and again this little three cell battery in here are actually three cells held together. Now each of these cells produce about 4.2 volts when they're fully charged and when they're completely empty is about three and a half volts. So when you read three and a half volts on each of the cells, the battery is empty and needs recharging. When it's fully charged, there's 4.2 volts in each of these four cells. Now, the other thing you'll notice on here, there's lots of other things written on. Things like milliamp hours, uh, C ratings. Let's talk about the milliamp hour rating first. Now, the milliamp hour rating is the capacity of the battery or how much energy is actually inside. This is a 3000 milliamp hour pack, MAH. This little one here is only a 500 milliamp hour pack. So this one has six times the capacity of this one. The higher the number, the more energy is inside, but the more heavy the battery. The C rating, which on this one is 30 to 40 C, is how quickly you can pull the energy out of a battery. And by multiplying the capacity by the C rating gives you the amperage that you can pull, but we'll get into that in a second. The higher the C rating, the faster you can drain the energy out of the battery without damaging it. So this one, for example, is reasonably average, 30 to 40 C discharge. And if we pick another battery up here, uh, this is a 1.5. That's actually a 1500 milliamp hour pack. Uh, again, this is a 4S battery, but this one has a C rating of 65 C. So if we multiply the 1500 milliamp hours, which is 1.5 ampere hours, but again, we'll get into that in a second, by the C rating, that'll tell us how quickly we can pull the power out. A fully charged LiPo is going to be whatever the number of cells in it times the 4.2 volts that will be in each of the cells. So for example, in this 4S battery, it's going to be 16.8 volts. In a 3S battery, something like this little 1300, perfect for a little wing, is going to be 12.4 volts, because each of the three cells in here would be at the 4.2 volt maximum. The other thing to keep in mind is that you don't discharge a battery till it's completely flat. In LiPo land, you take about 80% of the capacity out so that each of the cells inside the battery ends up at about 3.7 volts. Now, the way you do that is you put some kind of voltage alarm or you set a timer on the radio to make sure that whenever you land and you check the LiPo battery as you take it off, it hasn't gone below 3.6 or 3.7 volts. If it goes below that level and you discharge it below 3.5 volts, then there are mechanisms and ways that you can recover that battery but it can cause irreparable chemistry damage inside that'll mean that cell won't perform as well in future. 
So now we've talked about the basic pieces, let's talk about some of the common questions that I get when I'm talking to people about light pole batteries. The first one is, can you use different batteries on different models? And you can, but you have to be a little bit careful. So for example, you might have a 3S pack and you might have a 4S pack. Now these are both 1300 milliamp hour packs, but this one is a 3S pack, this one is a 4S pack, and you can see this one's an awful lot bigger, and it's got a much higher C rating. There's a lot more electrode metal in here to allow that current to flow. So if you're flying your model and it's working beautifully on this, can't you just smack one of these guys in because it's gonna fly faster, because it's gonna be a bigger battery, it's got more voltage? Well, the answer is, well, yeah, you probably can, but what you'll find is that props and motors tend to be rated for specific battery voltages. You'll see them supporting 2 to 6S, for example. But if you look at the thrust tables for the motors that you're interested in, you'll probably find that as you increase the number of cells or the voltage that is being used to run the motor, then the size of the prop that you need is going to decrease. So if, for example, you were running a model with a 3S battery and you put a 4S battery in it, you might find that everything got exceedingly warm and wasn't very happy. So be careful of that if you're going to change the batteries and put a bigger battery in your model, then you're probably going to have to swap the prop. You'll probably find as well that adding more cells or a bigger battery into a model will make it more powerful too. Back in the day, we were all flying 3S quadcopters and then we all moved on to 4S quadcopters and that's actually what a lot of these batteries are. I fly 1300 in a lot of the little racing quads. For longer flight times, I'll use something like a 1500 4S battery. And then for some of the quads where I'm not bothered about high performance and it's built to the specs, I'll use a 3S battery 2200. That'll give me eight, nine minutes of flight time, depending on how I'm flying. Now to work out the maximum amp draw that you can pull from each of these batteries is pretty straightforward. You just multiply the milliamp hour rating by the C rating. So if for example we have a 1300 battery and it's rated at 35 C, then that's going to work out at 45,500 milliamps or 45.5 amps. So for that battery, the maximum you could pull out is 45.5 amps safely. So if you have a 60 amp ESC in your model, then that's probably not going to be enough battery for you. In that situation, you're probably going to want to use a higher milliamp hour pack, or you're going to want to use a battery that has a much higher C rating. A couple of different connectors on here as well, it's worthwhile talking about. Pretty much everyone these days for most models are going to be using this yellow connector. This is an XT60, which is very much the default one now. There's a mini version of the XT60 called the XT30, which is just the baby version. Uh, there's also the XT90, which is the big daddy one. And those are the ones that you're going to come across the most often. For really small quadcopters, you'll occasionally find this kind of connector. This is a JST plug and uh, batteries can be got with those on as well. And then the adapter that you occasionally see on old stuff. I used to use these a lot back in the day. This is a Dean's connector. And Dean's was brilliant, but has been pretty much replaced now. Nobody uses it anymore. Everybody is XT60. Now you can buy adapter cables. You can also cut the ends off and resolder the connection on that you need. But most of the stuff these days, if you get one with an XT60, 99% of the time you're going to be fine. The other connector on here is called the balance tap. So as well as having the connector that you can plug into your model for power, this balance tap allows a charger to monitor the individual cells in here as it's charging it. And sometimes you can also use it in auxiliary power out if you want to power something like FPV gear as well. You can't pull a lot of current through these much thinner wires, but it will allow you to do it. And what you'll find is that if you're ever not sure of how many cells are inside a pack, just count the number of wires and it's one less than that. So this has four wires on the balance tap so this is a 3S battery. If it had three wires on the balance tap, it would be a 2S battery. 
So let's talk a little bit about how you charge these things. Now you will need a specialized charger. Some ready to fly models will come with cheap and cheerful ones. I'd recommend if you're getting into the hobby, invest in something like this ISDT charger that I'm using all the time. Modern chargers these days will typically have a number of different options for you to use with the battery as you're charging it. And the first one is going to be a charge cycle and that's going to put energy into the battery and it's going to stop charging the battery when each of the cells reaches that maximum 4.2 volts. There's something called a balanced charge and that does exactly the same as a charge but then also make sure that each of the individual cells are at that maximum level because with a charge you might find that in a 3S pack the first and third cell might be at 4.2 volts and the middle cell might be at 4.18 i.e. not fully charged. In a balanced charge then what it'll do is use the balance connector just to bring that last cell up to be the same as all the others. I'd recommend balance charging a pack once every five or six goes just to keep it completely happy. And the last mode is storage. Now you don't want to put LiPo batteries away if you, they are fully charged. Uh, they will very slowly discharge unless you're using a smart battery but I'm not going to cover all of that in this video. If you want to know more about that I'll put a link to the BatGo technology and you can have a read about it. But if you have a fully charged battery, maybe you come back from the field and you haven't managed to fly on that one, then I would put it back to storage charge and put it away. If you're going to use it within a couple of weeks then you can get away with leaving it fully charged until next time. But if it's going to be more than that I would put it down to a storage charge. Now storage charge puts each of the cells down to about 3.8 volts so while it's packed away, even if it gently discharges, it isn't going to fall below that 3.5 volts. And it's also not going to put any strain on the cells inside by storing it with full voltage. So to charge these things is pretty straightforward. Unless it actually says on the battery, I would always assume that you're going to charge it at 1C. Now 1C is all that means is it's just the capacity of the battery. So for example, this battery here, this is a 4S battery. We know it's 4S because it has five leads on the balance connector. This one is a 1500 milliamp hour pack or 1500 milliamps is the same as 1.5 amps. So I would put this on a charger and select 4S as the battery type and select 1.5 amps and set the charger off. Similarly with this one, this is a 2200 milliamp hour pack. That's actually 2.2 amps. So that's what I'd set the charger to when I was going to charge it. This one is a 1300 milliamp hour pack or a 1.3 amp hour pack. So I'd charge this at 1.3 amps. That is the maximum you should charge a pack unless it says so on it. Some packs let you charge at 2 or 3C. Unless you've got anything to show you otherwise, I would always charge a maximum of 1C. If you want to be nice to your batteries and make them last a little bit longer, you can actually charge less than this capacity. So this, for example, the maximum I'd charge it at is 1.3 amps. If I was being nice, I might charge it at something like 1 amp. It'll take a little bit longer to charge, but the battery will thank you for it. And the way modern chargers work is once it senses that the voltage is right in each of the cells, then it'll stop the charge. When you are charging LiPo batteries, always make sure that you have them in a LiPo safe bag. Now a LiPo safe bag means that if you have a very rare occurrence of a LiPo battery getting upset as it's being charged, then all of the gases that come out of it are actually contained within the bag that gives you a chance to get rid of it. Never leave a battery unattended when you're charging it. I tend to charge them on my desk and I have them in LiPo bags and I do it while I'm doing something else and then once they're finished I put them in a tin and keep them safely away from everything else. If you're careful and you treat your batteries with respect you should be fine. The videos on YouTube showing them bursting into flames are usually because somebody's done something stupid with them i.e. short circuited with them or tried to drive a nail through them. In general use, unless you actually physically damage the pack, most of them will last a very long time. The other thing to comment on is occasionally you'll get a battery, none of them on this uh, table have done it, because I tend to throw them away when they do. At the moment you can see that the edges on these batteries are pretty flat. Once they start to get a bit old, you'll notice that they'll start to puff up as though somebody has tried to blow them up like a balloon. If you start to see that puffiness, that means the battery is coming to the end of its life and you need to stop using it. 
Final thoughts on batteries, make sure that you invest in a decent charger. A decent charger is like the radio or FPV goggles. It will last you for years and years. I'm a big fan of things like the ISDT charge at the moment. They work really well and they seem to do a really good job of keeping the batteries in great shape. Make sure that you've got a way of keeping track of your charged and discharged batteries. I have a friend of mine who's lost a couple of quadcopters by flying over water without a fully charged battery and the battery kind of giving up as he uh, hasn't managed to make it back to dry land. I use these little things here. These are little clips that go on the end of the batteries that show you when it's charged. And then when I've finished, you, I just pop that across and I know that's discharge one and that's the way that I keep track. But have a way so you know when things are charged and when things are discharged because it's all too easy when you're out there at the field, particularly if you have only a couple of minutes on a model and you land it to change something, just keeping track of which ones have full charge and which ones don't. Make sure you use timers on your radios for all of your models. That'll make sure that you don't fly longer than the battery can support. And getting something like this, this is a little battery checker. And by plugging the balance tap into this at the field, there's loads of different types of these available, you can actually check and have a look at how much power is left in the battery. These are worth their weight in gold and will save you from destroying a battery and potentially damaging and crashing a craft as well. So hopefully that's interesting for those of you that are coming into the hobby and yet dispels a little bit of the myth about what LiPo batteries are. They're a fantastic battery technology and they pack an awful lot of power in a relatively small lightweight size, which is why they're so useful for radio control. But just treat them with care, treat them with respect, get yourself a good charger and hopefully now some of the questions that you have have been sorted out. And again, go and watch the other videos in both the beginner's question series and also the introduction to remote control for lots more tips and tricks. If you found that video useful or like the content, then please hit the like and subscribe button down below. If you want to go the extra step, you can become a Patreon of the Painless 360 channel and help provide support for what I do here. All the videos created here are put into playlists, so if you're interested in a particular topic, have a look at the playlist, and they all are organised in there to make them easier to use. If you're not sure if there's a video for your particular problem or topic you want to know more about, then add Painless360 to the Google search term that you're interested in, and that should find the video, article, or content about the particular thing that you're interested in having a look at.